Welcome to Good God, Conversations That Matter About Faith and Public Life. I am your host, George Mason, and I'm thrilled to uh, continue this series called American Faith with my friend and colleague in uh, Dallas, John Reed. John, we're glad you're here, and thank you for joining us on Good God. Thanks, George. I was very honored to be asked. Great. Well, John, your story, I think, is uh, of interest to people because, you know, whereas people uh, tend to be born into a faith and stay in it, uh, of course, the American experience especially is one of choice. And so uh, you have made a choice uh, having pursued and been reared in one faith tradition, and today you are a Buddhist. And in fact, right now you're in Hong Kong uh, studying in a master's level program about Buddhism. And so uh, I, I wonder if you just sort of introduce yourself to people and tell people about your journey to Buddhism. Well, I'd be happy to, George. Um, you know, a Texan will always tell you that they're a Texan. And so uh, I am indeed was born and reared in Texas and North Texas. Uh -huh. uh, and that's an important part of who I am as a person. Uh, I was uh, also raised in a Protestant Christian family, uh, specifically Southern Baptist, yes. uh, and, and remained in that tradition all the way through attending Southwestern Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth and serving on a, a Baptist church staff. Um, uh, um, My alma mater uh, also, by the way. Yes, yes, right. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's right. Uh, and um, I... Uh, uh, I, even as a college student, had my doubts uh, about my faith. I um, was a very zealous Christian uh, in high school and college, uh, seeking to, you know, proselytize, uh, to convert, uh, as, as was part of that, you know, faith tradition of the evangelical tradition. But yet I still had my doubts, and, um, uh, and I, I sought out uh, elders to talk to and and, and got guidance and, and, um, and continued to reaffirm my faith uh, uh, and, until a point that um, uh, in the Southern Baptist tra tradition, uh, there, there, there developed a great deal of, of, of a conflict in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this was deeply distressing to me uh, uh, because I had never thought about the role of power uh, in religion. Of course, now it's very obvious to me yeah, right. uh, in, in, in every religion, not, you know, not just uh, one particular one. Um, but I, I continued on the path because uh, I had been raised as a person of faith, and I really appreciate that my parents did that. And um, being part of a religious community was really important to me. But um, as I encountered people from other faiths, um, my certainty that I was on the one true path um, began to crumble, and um, and it took me several years of of uh, exploring. Um, and I, I was well. Let me think. It was roughly about uh, fifteen to twenty years ago, about twenty years ago, when I began to specifically read about Buddhism and found myself uh, deeply attracted to the emphasis on compassion um, and the emphasis on wisdom from. From, from many sources and, and uh, you know, not contributing to the suffering of others. Now, those are not unique qualities to one faith. Really, all faiths include those. Um, uh, however, um, Buddhism, particularly the Zen Buddhism that I was introduced to um, about 20 years ago, uh, with Zen, by the way, is a Japanese word, and... Uh, uh, the Chinese word is Chan, C-H-A-N. Um, that um, emphasized, uh, you know, you don't have to give up your mind. You can use your mind and you can think. And even the Buddha is, is reported to have taught that, you know, test it out for yourself. And so that was really appealing to me as well. I didn't have to believe something just because it was in a book or in the sacred that I could test it out then and explore it. And, and so roughly around 15 to 16 years ago is when I began to say, I am a Buddhist. 
yes. uh, at least to myself. You know, I didn't really broadcast that, but um, at least to myself, I said, okay, that's that's what fits me and fits my path at right. this point in my life. Right. So it, it's interesting that you you made the switch. You know, to you know, identify with a different religion, Buddhism, um, and yet Buddhism is this. A very interesting religion that many people do not make a, a, a complete break from their own religious tradition to incorporate certain Buddhist yeah. practices or teachings or yeah. uh, spiritual exercises. Uh, can you can you say a little bit about that? Because, uh, for instance, uh, <clears throat> one of my friends uh, uh, is is a practicing Catholic and uh, practices uh, Buddhist. Um, meditation and is very active in um, identifying both ways. So uh, how, how does that work? Well, particularly that Zen tradition, which emphasizes meditation and stillness, mm -hmm. um, being open to see things as they truly are, in itself doesn't conflict with uh, Christian teaching or Jewish teaching or, or many others. Um, and um, uh, I, I think we're probably talking about the first, the same person who was my first Buddhism teacher as well. Um, and yes, integrates Christianity, Catholic Christianity and, um, and Zen Buddhism very well. Uh, a number of Catholic priests have written about uh, have written books entitled The Christian Buddhist Dialogue, that, that sort of thing. Right. Um, a, a, an, an American Buddhist named Sylvia Borstein wrote a book, I'm forgetting, I think it was about 20 years ago or so, uh, called That's Funny, You Don't Look Buddhist. Uh -huh. And then the subtitle was Being a Faithful Jew and a Compassionate Buddhist. Okay. Um, and um, I, I get the same thing, that nobody looks at me and thinks, oh, he's Buddhist. Right, you know, right. We 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 associate it. Uh, most parts of the world associate it with being Asian, right. uh, and um, even though plenty of Asians are 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 you know Christian or uh, but but so there's especially Zen or Chan Buddhism mm -hmm. really does integrate well with um, spiritual spirituality uh, of Christianity uh, and Judaism. Um, I, I would think also Islam, but I, I don't haven't explored that a whole lot. So, uh. so Buddhism is the fourth largest religion in the world, uh, and uh, it, it it originates back in the fifth to fourth century uh, BCE. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell this originating story a bit and how it progressed from there, and what what are key tenets and things like that, John? Okay, um, the Buddha, as we know him. Uh, or know about him was born the wealthy son of a of a wealthy landowner, uh, kind of on the border of India and Nepal. Um, um, he was lived, lived a very privileged life. Uh, his father went to great lengths to make sure he never saw anything unpleasant. Mm -hmm. So he never saw people, old people. I don't know how they managed that, but uh, he, he he didn't see sick people or dying people or dead people and. Um, he, he, but this life of luxury was just not meaningful to him. And he, he uh, wondered why, I guess I've had to have everything that, that, uh, that's supposed to make man happy. Why, why don't I, why am I not happy? Yet? Um, and he snuck out of the palace, the palace compound with a trusted uh, um, member of the, of the staff there. And he saw, you know, uh, the, the, the frail elderly, the dying and the dead and people who were just were very ill. Um, and this shocked him. I mean, I, I, uh, I really haven't thought too deeply about how, you know, how would I feel if I'd never seen any of that and then just an adulthood saw it and didn't know it was there. But, you know, that would be shocking. And he uh, desired to know what causes people to suffer. Um, and so he, he, his, his wife had just given birth to a son and yet he had determined that he needed to go search for an answer to what causes human suffering and, and what can be done about it. You know? um, and, and so he went on a journey, a six year journey uh, to, to he, he tried starving himself. He tried 
denying himself any kind of pleasure out there because uh, he had already experienced uh, affluence right. and that didn't make him happy. And, and then he tried, okay, I'll deny myself, which was a common practice in that part of the world, you know, to give away everything and have not, no possessions and, and beg for your food. And, he's, and so he discovered the middle path right that 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 uh, the answer isn't at either of those two extremes mm -hmm. you know that we don't have to deny things that are pleasurable but that when we crave them it causes us suffering right. and it causes us suffering because you know we may we try to make ourselves look beautiful and handsome but age catches up with us you know uh and and gravity catches up with us and um and just recently, uh, in, in many parts of the U.S. and in Texas, you know, people lost their lives because of the ice storm and uh, lost their homes if they burned down and so forth. And even those treasured possessions that we think, I'm going to keep this forever, you know, that they're impermanent. And, um, uh, and so he, he uh, uh, began to teach as people said, what's the deal with you? You know, you seem so peaceful. Um, and um, he, he began to say, well, this is what causes suffering. Life is full of suffering. Uh, some people think Buddhists uh, think life is miserable, and that's not what he meant. Uh, you know, we, we have times of pleasure and joy and happiness, and those are, are real. They're just temporary. And so uh, he said, life is full of suffering. It's inevitable that we won't suffer in life. Um, and that suffering is because we crave living forever or you know having our loved ones with us forever and, and or our possessions and there's a way out of that suffering if we will you know identify acknowledge our craving and cease to not not necessarily give away everything he said we didn't have to do that but we need to you know practice generosity and and to share and care about the suffering of others uh, and then he laid out an eightfold path of um, of how a person can live uh, and and practice the um, uh, re redu reducing of craving in life and clinging to things that are impermanent. Right. The notion of attachment and detachment is a significant uh, concept uh, in this and. Uh, as is this question of the the role of the self, I think, uh, which you you and I uh, both know from our from Christian scripture and Jesus' words about uh, we you know we're told to deny ourselves and to uh, take up our cross and follow Him, uh, but this idea of denial of self uh, seems in the Christian tradition to be more around the idea of denying that. Um, that sense of self that is socially determined, uh, that is uh, somehow not your authentic self, uh, but rather to uh, deny yourself in order that you might receive the gift of self, uh, in a sense, uh, more genuinely from God that is not dependent upon things and people. Uh, how does that square with a Buddhist teaching about self and attachment and detachment and things like that? Well, my uh, background in, in studying and teaching psychology um, in, includes a, an important theory about attachment, and so I kind of struggled with with that. We, you know, psychology teaches that we attach to our loved ones, and that gives us a feeling of security mm -hmm. and helps us be emotionally healthy. And and I mean that that is indeed part of how we develop as human beings and not just humans, other species as well, uh, you know, ducks and geese and dogs and cats and so forth. Um, um, and so this is uh, the word attachment can cause some complications for people. You know, does that mean I'm not supposed to love anybody? Right. Well, the answer to that is no. Um, you know, we are human. It is our nature to love and to, to want and to need others. Um, um, and, and that really takes a lot of time to you know, sort out what that means for an individual. Um, okay, I, yes, I can love, I can marry, I can have children. That's not going to conflict with Buddhism. In fact, 
you know, Buddhism would stop, like the Shaker's faith. Right. Did, right. Yes. If, if you don't have make babies, you know, right. Right. Uh, and uh, um, uh, and so no, that's absolutely not forbidden. I mean, the Buddha was married and had children, and uh, and he stayed married, uh, uh, and his his um, uh, uh, his wife died soon after the birth of the son, but his stepmother actually became one of his followers, and his son uh, and, and other family members, and so forth. Um, but we often tell ourselves. Um, you know, um, I am who I am based on identity or faith or family and so forth. And those are the things we need to acknowledge and not, not crave. And, and that's difficult to do. It's much easier to talk about, you know, the not getting the newest uh, Apple Watch or the right. newest uh, car or something. And we really can see that those things um, bring us temporary joy, <laughs> but only temporary. You know, uh, uh, that's really easy to say. Those are the things that, yeah, we 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 may very, we mean we need transportation. We need to tell time, um, but I can live without those things. You know, um, uh, Buddhism does not teach that we should try to live without relationships. I mean, there there is the the what's called the sangha, the Buddhist community. You know, twenty five hundred years ago, uh, when the Buddha was born as Siddhartha Gautama, um, and and uh, when people be and became enlightened, people began to gather around him, and they formed a religious community. And his disciples went out to India and and um, Sri Lanka and uh, Afghanistan and. And, and uh, anyway, just all over that part of the world uh, and started their own Buddhist communities. And, uh, and indeed, uh, when a person officially, you know, in, in Christianity, there's a conversion experience. You know, it can be um, kind of a sudden dramatic conversion experience, or it can be sort of, a, a, you know, a, a going through... A, Confirmation process uh, right. yeah. uh, in many faiths, and um, uh, um, and and part of becoming a Buddhist is saying, "I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Buddhist teaching, which is the Dharma, and I take refuge in the Buddhist community, the Sangha." Mm -hmm. So now there are Buddhist communities, like in the Dallas area, quite a few. Uh, most of them are ethnic groups, you know, Chinese. Uh, Vietnamese, Laotian, Tibetan, and, and so forth, uh, Korean. And, um, um, but anyway, so I, I've, I, I've kind of gotten off the, the path here a little bit, I think, uh, in trying to answer. Um, it, it is difficult to think about non-self, but we can best understand it if we think about that the, the me that I think of as me is dependent on other on, is dependent on causes. I mean, literally, my parents and my grandparents, mm -hmm. and 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 also the literalness of the food and the shelter and the clothing that I got that helped me develop, um, and also the conditions. Um, those periods of time where a lot of babies die, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then and then in certain countries, even still in our world today, you know, where a majority of babies die, um, or there's you know we're facing. Uh, half a million deaths from COVID in the U.S. And, and so uh, as individuals, the, this self I call John Reed is, de is dependent on causes and conditions. Right. And the, those came together and made me. Right. Um, and so that's where we talk about the impermanence of self or no self, is that recognize that the you you call you uh, is completely dependent on on many things that were at, or that were outside of your control. Uh, and even now, uh, although I wasn't in North Texas during the, the big freeze recently, I remember years past of going without electricity for days. Right. Uh, and I noticed I have a very narrow comfort range. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, mean, I mean, literally, of course, we have a, a, a range that we need to stay alive, but for me to identify myself as comfortable, it's pretty narrow. 
Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, and um, and so that's that cause that's a sticking point for a lot of people. Is, you know, how can you say there's no self? Are you saying I don't exist? And no, that's that's not what it's saying. It's just that what we, you know, it's that we are here dependent on mm-hmm. so many other things. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the concept of nirvana, that word, is uh, something that's come into common parlance, you might say, in, uh, mm-hmm. and, and I'm not sure people understand much of what it means except a, a, a feeling of um, uh, maybe um, blessedness or uh, peacefulness mm-hmm. or something of that mm-hmm. nature. Uh, I think some people perhaps wrongly identify it with the Christian notion of heaven, for instance. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Help us understand when, when a Buddhist talks about nirvana, what what state has one arrived at when uh, one crosses into that uh, category of nirvana? Um, so this concept have, has a long history, uh-huh. you know, back to you know twenty five hundred years ago and longer uh-huh. in Hinduism. Um, and uh, we exist in this cycle of, of life and death. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I was raised to believe that you just, got, you just have this one life, right? you know, and you die and go to heaven or hell. Of course, I never met anybody in America who thought they were going to hell, right. <laughs> whether they were devout or not. Right. Even their obituary connects them to a faith right. so that they can slip into heaven, you know. Right. Um, but... Um, uh, so, uh, but but in Hinduism and in Buddhism, there is a belief that we are reborn. We we have a rebirth. Right. Uh, uh, we start off as our beings and creatures, and then we have this wonderful good fortune to be born as a human being, mm-hmm. because we have a mind and we can study the teachings of the Buddha, uh, and and also have life experiences that we gain wisdom from. Uh, and then hopefully have a more favorable rebirth. Mm-hmm. And so um, it is, you're right that, that people think of nirvana as sort of heavenly euphoric, but really it's a state where we're no longer having any feelings whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, because think about, like I'm having good feelings talking to you uh, and, and I want those to continue, but they won't, right? I mean, this conversation will come to an end right. and I hope we'll have other conversations, but but you know, when we're in a pleasant state, we want it to continue. Right. But by its nature, it won't. You know, it will come to an end for whatever reason. Um, and so, uh, nirvana means we're no we're no longer in that cycle of of uh, being reborn or dying. Okay. We're no where we have no suffering. Um, and you know, we don't we seek out pleasurable experiences. It's just our nature to do that. And uh, and you bet, I want more of those too. Right. Um, um, uh, but they lead to suffering. Right. You know, when, when I'm uh, outside and the weather is perfect, according to my definition of perfect, right. I, I, I want it to continue, but it can't, you know, it won't. And, um, and so even those wonderful experiences and feelings cause suffering because they will come to an end. And we cling to, we've, you know, we were clinging to them. Mm-hmm. When we can get to a place of saying, you know, I accept and appreciate where I am right now, or if I'm suffering, I, I mean, I identify that I'm suffering. I know that this too will pass, you know, that, that, that suffering doesn't last forever. Uh, I mean, a state of suffering anyway. And um, um, then I, I'm not, uh, you know, wishing for something to be different. This is, the way it is, and I accept that. I do need to offer a disclaimer, though, that uh, because uh, the work that that I've enjoyed being a part of that you're involved with in Dallas is reducing uh, suffering and, and oppression. Right. And and uh, and so, uh, uh, especially modern Buddhism is very focused on uh, social justice, so called socially engaged Buddhism. Uh, it doesn't mean that that was never important. It just is. It just is much more dominant now in, in this uh, in Buddhism, um, and so it doesn't mean that we accept injustice. Right. Uh, Buddhists have a, a, a responsibility to reduce suffering. Right. And right. so it doesn't mean that we just accept oppression as reality, but we um, 
it's like, well, if I'm really cold, uh, um, you know, I, I acknowledge I'm cold, mm -hmm. but I don't have to, well, like I have kept some back pain periodically. Many of us do as we get older, or if we thought we were football players or something at one time in life. And, and uh, I was at a meditation retreat many years ago, and my back was really hurting. And I was thinking, this is not fair. I'm here trying to make myself a better person. I'm trying <laughs> to practice my spirituality. My back hurts, and I can't do it. Yeah. And then I had awakening. Right. I'm suffering in great part because I'm focusing on the pain. Uh -huh. If I just acknowledge that, yes, my back hurts. Right. And just... Yeah, I mean, I shifted to try to get a better position. And at the break time, I got a different pillow to sit on. And But wow, my suffering lessened when I acknowledged, yes, my back hurts. Right. And I didn't wish it to be different. I mean, I didn't think it's not fair or unjust. It just, yes, it hurts. And the pain lessened. Uh, and I mean, it was still there, but I wasn't focused on it. Right. So, and there's the literal cause of, physical pain and then there's the psychological pain that we add to it by saying you know as i was saying myself this isn't fair <laughs> right now john buddhism is um curious in that there's not a lot of discussion about god uh in right. the religion uh for example you know we as christians we uh might meditate but we will also pray uh mm -hmm. and so there's a, a sense of a uh, a God to whom we pray and a personal God in, in that sense. Uh, but Buddhism is more of uh, a, a way of, of uh, adjusting to reality of a, a kind of a way of life where uh, if a concept of God is present, it's more uh, associated with reality itself. Am I right about that? Or is that different? Do you have a different way of putting that? Well, um, what I've discovered is that there's Buddhism as taught in the books, the sacred scriptures, right. and there's Buddhism as people practice it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that took me years to realize that a lot of practicing Buddhists also believe in gods, not a supreme being God, but an earth God or a, I see. Um, a God of money. Or, mm -hmm. But now those, those are not all powerful gods. Right. Uh, they are gods with power. And uh, in one of his books, uh, Venerable or uh, Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Zen yeah. Master, said that according to Judeo-Christian Muslim uh, perspective, he said, I'm an atheist. Right. Um, because, um, you know, believing in, in a god or gods is not a part of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Buddha, when asked questions about, about those things that, that we can believe, but that we can't prove. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I mean, I certainly said yes. I know there's a God. You know, when I was a practicing Christian, and um, but that was a belief. You know, and that was based on feelings and experiences and so forth. And and I absolutely do not criticize that view or any other faith for that matter. Uh, just the Buddhist said, we we there's things we can't know and we can't prove, mm -hmm. and let's not bother with those questions. Right. You know, let's do what we can to reduce our own suffering and craving and, and okay. so forth. Um, and so the world he was born into, there was belief in many gods. Right. You know, there were celestial beings that we might call angels. And, um, and um, uh, you know, and people believed in those. But he, you know, he, he basically, yeah, Buddhism does not have God in it. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't require a belief in God, but, but many Buddhists do pray to the Buddha, you know, please give me, yes. you know, help my son passes or, or my daughter pass their SATs and, you know, ACTs. And, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of that amongst practicing Buddhists. Mm -hmm. And even though the Buddha is technically and, and according to that doctrine, not a God, certainly many people uh, treat the Buddha as, as God or a God. Um, uh, and you mentioned earlier, and I don't think I ever got back to it, that Buddhism has been adaptable in any context it's ever been in. You know, we're in the midst in the United States of developing an American Buddhism, 
although there's a huge degree of disagreement about what that even means. Um, but um, I mean, like, does it mean primarily mindfulness, which is, you know, I mean, I, you can't listen to the radio or the TV without hearing someone say, be mindful of the weather. Yes. You know, that's, of course, not what mindfulness means. But uh, I mean, OK, I'm supposed to be fully aware of the weather and, and uh, you know, one with the weather. Is that what they're, you know, and of course, it's they're just being. Yeah, pay attention to the weather, you know, but that's not mindfulness, you know, and the Buddha, uh, but mindfulness probably, is very, very oh, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say that the Buddha is probably the uh, original woke person uh, in, <laughs> right. in today's language, right? <laughs> that mindfulness, oh, right. awakening and yeah. enlightenment, right. yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, John, I think you're getting into now the American experience a little bit, and, and that uh, takes us, you know, toward the end of our conversation now, but uh, but to the, the point of this series of our conversations is, what is the American experience of a Buddhist? Uh, that is, you know, we have, um, uh, we, we have a deliberately pluralist country uh, constitutionally, uh, but, you know, on the ground, uh, Protestant Christianity has, uh, for the duration of our uh, country, been the sort of default culture, you might say, religious, yeah. civic, relig civil religion. Uh, so uh, when, when you go about having known what it's like to be part of the dominant culture uh, religiously, yeah. Yeah. where are those points of challenge for an American Buddhist in the American experience? Um, so I've had the unique experience, like you say, of being, um, well, it's not unique to be in the re uh, religious majority and then into a religious minority, but I don't look Buddhist by anybody's definition of Buddhism right. and what it looks like. And so in the U.S., when when the conversation comes up about faith, uh, people are shocked or stunned or um, or they say, cool, <laughs> uh, you know, and, they, and I say I'm a Buddhist because of that, that, you know, that, that serene Buddha statue image right. uh, uh, of being peaceful. And I, and, but what was I was getting to with the unique experience of when I'm in Asia, nobody expects me to be Buddhist either. Uh, okay. You know, they, they assume I'm Christian. Right. And I've I've taught psychology and English in in mainland China several times. Um, at some point in the conversation of my teaching, I feel like I need to disclose that you know you probably would assume I'm Christian, but and I was, but I'm a practicing Buddhist now. Uh, and once again, there's a lot of shocked looks uh, about like why, and then there's, you know, more one-on-one -on -one of why. I don't get into the why part in, in class, but, um, you know, uh, I, um, so I had this privilege and I really didn't like that word when I first heard it. Uh, I'm, I'm a white male and I was Protestant, you know, and I'm the firstborn male in my nuclear family and I got some privilege from that. Uh, and I, you know, I grew up not realizing I had all these privileges because we were not a rich family. We weren't even hardly middle income at that point. And, um, but over time, as I've been willing to see uh, the way things are, it's like, wow, I, I've gotten a lot of privilege. I'm also taller than average, and I get some privilege from that. But not from the airlines, though. <laughs> you know, being, that is not a place of privilege if you're tall or big. Um, but um, and so eventually, as I began to learn more about other faiths and, you know, I was in high school when the Vietnam War ended. Uh, I graduated in 1976 and I saw all these Vietnamese immigrants mm -hmm. and Cambodians and Laotians and I mean, a lot of Vietnamese were Catholic um, right. and, and, and still are. Um, but I, I began to realize that they had a very different world that they had come from and, and wanted to learn more about that. And it, it took years and years for me to, to kind of to sort of develop the ears of the, of the immigrant. Mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, my ancestors were immigrants way, way, way back when. Um, but once again, I've been in the majority in so many categories in my life that I did. Uh, it took me a while to sort of hear what a woman's ears hear, 
yes. regarding male privilege or what a person of color hears with regard to white privilege. And, um, and when all your holidays are Christian, right. uh, you know, you just think that's normal in the way it should be when you've grown up Christian. And, you know, it took a while for me to hear that all these words in our, on our calendar and, and our, Public speech um, are are geared towards Christianity, and you know radio hosts uh, probably think nothing of talking about going to church this Sunday. Right. You know, as if that either is what people should do or uh, or are predominantly doing. Um, you know, ignoring that a lot of faiths don't call it church. Uh, you know, and and um, uh, and that they meet on Saturdays or Friday evening. And, and so forth. Right. Um, so um, I, I'm not offended. I mean, Amer Amer America has this wonderful ideal, mm -hmm. you know, of, of religious pluralism. But you know, that's a constant battle. As it is. you know, Faith Forward Dallas, and and I've also been a part of the Richardson Interfaith Alliance, mm -hmm. and I just treasure those opportunities of meeting with people from different faith traditions the love and respect and, and the dialogue. It, I, I was just thinking that to me is sort of like a, a, a vaccine, uh, a, a which I need regularly, a vaccine against the pain of the hatred and, the, and the, that we hear. Right. Um, when I, every time I gather together with that group, those groups, it's like, okay, there's hope for this world. <laughs> there's hope for this country because these people with very different beliefs can focus on what they share what they have in common without uh, pointing a finger at who's right or wrong and what they believe, you know, and well, that's the point of, as our you know, American there's, faith. yeah, that's yeah. the point of our American faith. Good God series is to yeah. uh, become better versed with one another so that we can overcome those differences, uh, not to diminish the differences of different mm -hmm. faiths, but to uh, find those places where, we can see the humanity of one another and celebrate our life together. So thank you, John Reed, all the way from Hong Kong, uh, <laughs> but really North Texas, uh, sharing right. life together with us and yeah. in this American faith experience. Uh, yeah. God thank bless you. Thank you so much, George. Thank you. All yeah. right. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.